Hi, welcome to Tent Talk, the Farmer's Market Podcast. This is a show all about farmer's markets. Whether you're a farmer's market manager, a farmer, or a food producer selling at farmer's markets, or just a curious farmer's market shopper, this is the podcast for you. On this week's episode, we chat with Amber Holland, Operations Director for Portland Farmer's Markets. Amber has worked for Portland's Farmer's Markets for over 10 years and helps manage their six markets. In our interview, Amber tells us about her efforts to reduce waste at the farmer's markets, the challenges of placing vendors when your market site becomes a construction zone, and her passion for creating inclusive community gathering spaces for Portland residents and visitors. Hi, I'm one of your hosts, Bridget Myers. I've spent years as an on-site farmer's market manager, and I've done it all from pulling permits to popping tents. I'm another one of your hosts, Justine marzoni Mead, hot sauce maker and event facilitator for the Intense Conference. And I'm Kat Fields-White, director of San Diego Markets, still moving barricades at farmer's markets every week, and founder of Intense Business. Welcome back to Tent Talk. This week, our guest is Amber Holland of Portland Farmer's Markets. Amber was born and raised in Portland, Oregon, and loves what the Pacific Northwest has to offer for food and play. As operations director, she oversees PFM's six markets. Amber began working with Portland Farmers Market in 2007 while attending graduate school at Portland State University, earning a master's in public administration in 2009. Amber was a presenter at the 2017 Intense Conference, and we are so excited to have her back again at our 2019 event. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yeah, Yeah, I can hear you. (laughs) Yay, can you hear us? Yes. yes. Cool. Excellent. Cat? Yeah. How are you? Hi, Cat. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> we tried so hard to get together when I was in Portland. Oh, <laughs> we were didn't just work out. kept missing each other. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> what are you busy or something? <laughs> right. Oh well. So, being a native uh, Portlander, have farmers markets always been a part of your community? Like, did your family shop at markets when you were growing up? Uh, absolutely not. <laughs> so, <laughs> in fact, when I applied for this job, I'd never even been to a farmer's market. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, I know. 12, 12, almost 13 years ago, that is. Wow. Um, so I started out working in animal care and through undergraduate, Kedib was on the, the veterinary path. And basically what I found is that I gravitated towards more of the coordination roles. Um, yeah. So setting up spay neuter clinics in, in rural areas or um, you know, managing volunteer veterinarians coming in was was where I was kind of, I was good at it, and I also really liked doing it almost more than taking care of, of cute dogs and cats. Yeah. <laughs> um, so so when I came back from a few years of doing that, I I realized that I didn't want to be a vet um, and didn't really know what I wanted to do, and I guess I didn't really care so much. I just wanted to work with really passionate people about doing things that are really important just in general, whether it's working with animals or developing small businesses or, or social justice or you know, food access or whatever it was. So I went back to grad school and the job with Portland Farmers Market as a, a, a market coordinator opened. It was part-time, it was seasonal, it was outside, it was manual labor. And I liked all of those things um, while in school. And I just kind of stayed and I did. I fell in love with farmers markets. I fell in love with the 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 vibe and the atmosphere and the community that you are kind of instantly a part of when you, when you shop at a farmer's market or vend at a farmer's market or work for a farmer's market. So um, that's how I got into it. And I graduated from grad school and I realized that I was doing exactly what I wanted to do, which is working with really passionate people, helping them get to where they want to be. Um, and it was kind of a perfect fit. That's awesome. Yeah, it sounds like a yeah. great job, as we know. Right. It's just <laughs> <laughs> kind of checks all the boxes if you're right. that kind of person. So that's yep, so awesome. Yep. So how has your role at the Portland Farmers Markets evolved? Mm-hmm. So you started as a market coordinator. Are you do- And then we're going to speak more about the programs that you have there, but did you transition into different roles as you went along, or how did that kind of take off from what you started doing? Yeah, so um, I started as a market coordinator, which our market coordinators um, really do the logistic stuff on site. So not a lot of that um, preseason planning or vendor applications, but really being on site, kind of putting out fires when needed and supporting vendors and, and giving service to shoppers. Um, it is a part time and seasonal position. And so anytime there was, you know, how grassroots organizations can be. It's like, oh, we need someone to manage volunteers or, oh, we need someone to take take on the website or whatever. <laughs> um, so I ended up doing a little bit of everything throughout the, the last 13 years that I've been with PFM. Um, 
including volunteer management. And then for a couple of years, I worked part-time as our accounting assistant. Um, And then uh, let's see, about three years ago, I moved into a year round full-time position and started as operations director this year. So it does give me a really unique perspective in my job because I understand how the billing works, for example, and I understand what it is to chase vendors around and try and get payments from them or engage volunteers and keep them satisfied and wanting to come back as well. So Nice. So that's always nice. I feel like when someone makes their way like toward the top, just doing all those jobs along the way, because it really gives you an understanding that you can't get any way else, you know, yeah. you know, anytime else. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, a, and a, lev- a level of satisfaction, because I understand the kind of the nuances of other people's jobs. And so I can be yeah. a little more supportive and understanding at times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's really helpful. Exactly. Yeah. So, you've, so you've got the huge, beautiful year round Portland state market. But then you also have five other seasonal markets, and they all seem to be on different schedules. How do you determine uh, the length of each market season and when they start and stop? You know, it's um, it really depends on the market and the the community that we're serving. So we've got three neighborhood markets and then two other downtown markets, including the um, in addition to the Portland State University market. Um, Our shortest market is one of the ones downtown, and it really thrives during tourist season. And then it really kind of dies off. So we we have made adjustments to that schedule to make it really successful for vendors. Is that the Pioneer Square market? Yes. Yeah, I was surprised that that season dropped out because it seems like Portland's so full of tourists all the time now. But um, yeah, so I was surprised to see that one was closed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, more more of the fair weather tourists come in. September. Gotcha. They're like, yeah. oh, it's <laughs> raining. I'm not going to <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, We know. Yeah. <laughs> and then people. and then our down our neighborhood markets. We've really listened to our vendors and our shoppers. You know, most of our shoppers at our neighborhood markets they they don't care if it's rain raining or or 95 degrees. They're going to come to the market and they're going to support their favorite vendors. So as soon as those vendors are really ready to provide products for the market, um, then we're really ready to extend those seasons. Um, if vendors really aren't into it, like our, our Lentz International Farmers Market, it is a June through uh, November market. And in June, it's kind of a slow start. You know, there's only about 60% of the vendors are really ready with a whole lot of product. So we're not really going to push to open that market in May like we would our King Market, um, where it's full of produce in May. So we really we really kind of try and work with our vendors to make sure that the market is is what our shoppers want, but also if, if the growing season isn't going to allow for an extended season, then then we just won't do it. Gotcha. Yeah, I thought Lentz was interesting because of all the international vendors. Yes, yes, definitely. definitely. It's kind of different. And then one of your markets isn't going to be back next year, it looks like. So how do you get to the decision to close a market? Yeah, we closed um, we closed a Northwest market beginning this year, and it was a decision that we made after the first of the year. So a lot of our publications still make reference to it. Um, we're here for the farmers. We're here for, uh, for their success and for their need for an outlet. You know, those fields just keep producing food and they've got to take it somewhere. Um, so when we get a small market that is kind of on a decline and a decline can be maybe shopper attendance or vendor attendance, when you start to feel that decline is when you start to really pay attention and it's like, what's, what's going to happen? Um, with our Northwest market, uh, we did, we lost vendor interest is mm. really what it came down to. Gotcha. And without a good lineup of vendors, we're, we're just not going to put the effort forward. Who, who's it for basically? Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, so we did, we did decide to close that market, um, so we're down to six from seven. <laughs> Which is still a lot of markets. Yeah, still <laughs> plenty. <laughs> How many vendors do you have at the Portland State Market? Uh, that one, we, we actually hit our all-time high for the season earlier this month at 125 vendors, which nice. takes about 175 stalls. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and then those numbers drop as low as 45 in um, like January as our lowest vendor oh. count. But we also reduce our footprint back to a single park walk. Oh, gotcha. Okay, so we were wondering, that was a, another question, is how you adjust the market when vendors leave for the season. Because I know we're familiar with a few vendors that are just gone, like November, December, January, and then I guess there's others, especially produce vendors that are gone for a little bit longer, and then they're back. Yeah, yeah. So we we, we do back off on our size a little bit. Um, it helps with our own staff capacity. Our shopper counts definitely, our peak summer numbers for shopper counts are around fifteen or 16,000. And in the wintertime, a really good day is going to hit about 5,000. Oh, so, gotcha. Oh, so big difference. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that reduction in shopper count just kind of naturally 
reduces the vendor interest. Sure. And it kind of just works out. Do you think that's such a drastic change because you are in kind of a tourist adjacent area there? Um, yeah, and Portland winters can be pretty terrible. So people just stay <laughs> yeah. inside, order Amazon, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Grocery delivery, delivery is, exactly. is happening there. Yeah. Yep. yep, you betcha. But in addition to the seasonal stuff, you've had to work around a lot of layout changes with all the construction around Portland State and in your, your park blocks area there, the street construction and things. How do you approach changing vendor placement in the market when you're having to make those, when construction fences are going up and down and different areas are dug up? How do you decide? who moves and and how to rearrange things i try you know we, we try to make as um our decisions to we try to make our decisions as collective as possible so really bringing in as many players as we can when it when we can and ultimately we make the decision for the market um so one of the vendors that had to move for this construction is one of our i, I think they've been with us for 23 years so the justice of having to move a a really long-term vendor um didn't feel particularly fair, but mm-hmm. um, the support that we gave for that vendor to find their success, whether it's placing signage at their old location to get their shoppers to follow them, um, maybe reducing their stall fees by a little bit to kind of account for any loss that they may have seen. And both of our large farms that um, we were the most concerned about because they had serious moves, um, they recovered after about a month, but there oh, was okay, definitely good. a month of, of sales that were not great. Huh, interesting. Um, so yeah. how did they react? Have most of them been understanding of the fact that you're just doing it because you've got all this construction and it's not like you have a choice? Or do you, oh, We have certain vendors that if you move them 10 feet, they're hysterical. <laughs> and, if, uh, and then we have other vendors that just kind of go with the flow and, and they're chill. Um, what, what kind of reactions were you getting there? Um, mostly understanding, mostly cool. understanding. It's funny that the hysterics that come from a market move of 10 feet tend to be when you least expect it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just, I just needed you to get off of the sidewalk. Crowd right. And just move over. And <laughs> My customers will and... never find me here. <laughs> <laughs> really was something but you know i did have we had the 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 fortune it was fortunate that we had this giant fencing that went up yeah. and all of this construction a visible um, reason for having to move a vendor it definitely kind of let us put right. the blame on something else and focus <laughs> right. on solutions and yeah. and getting off to as get, getting as good of a market as possible yeah, but i good. started those conversations with the farms that had to move really move um, i started those conversations middle of last year and we walked the market and I threw out a couple of solutions. So it was like, here's the here's the facts. The facts are that you can't stay here because if you do, congestion will be a total nightmare. So you we, we do have to move you. And we've got six months to plan for that move. And here are three options that I think could work for you. Yeah, I find um, that's really helpful if you can give somebody choices so they're yeah. part of the decision and part of the change. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Nobody wants to be surprised on Saturday morning to find oh, out no. that they're not where <laughs> no. they were supposed to be. No, <laughs> no that never goes well. <laughs> <laughs> then I'm in tears. Yeah, yeah right? exactly. we're all crying Everyone's then. crying. Everyone's, Everyone's crying, crying then. Crying. <laughs> so Amber, um, I've heard and also read in your bio that uh, one of your passions is to um, work to reduce waste at farmers markets. Um, and it seems like the Portland farmers market has uh, worked really hard to um, implement some different waste reduction programs. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, how you got really interested in that and what uh, PFM has done to help at their actual farmers markets. Sure. Well, as market staff, it's it's our responsibility to deal with the waste of the market. So after two years of hauling bags and bags and bags of trash, like you're looking for any relief at all. So, <laughs> mm-hmm. so it's totally self-serving. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Always <laughs> the best, <laughs> best incentive. I'm sure you're looking for a more philosophical response. <laughs> it was like, if I could haul five last bags of trash, I would do that for sure. Yep. Um, and then uh, years years ago, we started um, a program called Evergreen, and that was a coworker that has since moved on, but is still a very dear friend, and, and she was definitely the driving force bet- behind us getting on commercial composting and requiring our vendors to use wares that were approved by the composting facility that would, in theory, break down, and our, our waste would go from landfill into compost. Um 
it seemed like a good idea. And because we were very close friends, like I kind of caught the bug too and, and was there like sorting trash and digging through the compost to get out contaminants and going through all of that. What I found though, is that fewer and fewer people were using reusable things because they had this perception that compost is healthy for the environment. Yeah, mm-hmm. huge and false security. <laughs> it really is. It really is. And so I almost felt like I was hauling more bags of waste. <laughs> they oh. just happened to be in green bags. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so when, when that failed, when our city's commercial composting failed, and it, it literally, like, things just didn't break down because there was so much of this fake plastic and not enough of the organic matter that they eliminated our commercial composting. And we knew we couldn't go back. Um, So with that, it was more about avoiding the waste in the first place and really educating shoppers and vendors about what it is to, to reduce our waste at the farmer's market. And at the same time, with our durable dining program, which has reduced all kinds of waste, um, we found that the experience for shoppers was also improved. You know, you, you most people are either sitting cross-legged in a park with their plate of food or they're balanced on a ledge somewhere, maybe just a bench. We only put out a, a certain number of tables for, for seating. Um, so when they had a durable plate to sit on, it suddenly was just a more enjoyable experience. You weren't balancing a crepe that was all unruly on a paper plate that was folding underneath them. They actually had a plate to use a fork and, and enjoy their meal, which our food is incredible. You know, it's this really high quality food made with the best ingredients and then is served on this like, you know, kind of gross throwaway <laughs> thing. So yeah. now it really feels like we've upped our upped our game a little bit and, and as a consequence reduced the waste. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So for people that don't know, can you elaborate on what durable dining is? Yes, yes. Durable dining is a, a, a program of ours um, where – it's had many iterations as we've worked through and and, figured, and failed and gotten feedback and figured it all out. But ultimately, what our durable dining program is now is that hot food vendors at our uh, PSU market and our neighborhood markets are required to um, serve their hot food on durable plates using durable utensils and durable cups. So those are plastic plates that are taken back and washed and reused time after time. Um the we we do allow some paper so if you've got a boat for example you can put like a a plastic or a basket not a boat but if you've got a basket you can line it with paper to kind of eliminate some of that real mess um but otherwise everything is is durable and those those things are are being used over and over again so does the i'm sorry does the market uh uh provide the the durable plates or is that something that the vendor has to provide in the very beginning, we, we toyed with the idea of providing, and we started with forks um, because forks are easy and everybody uses them. Uh, our idea was that we would own them and we would contract with someone else to wash and store and, and charge vendors for like a rental. So we would, t- we would take responsibility for the loss and for, for getting them to market and all of that. Um, vendors kind of got together and decided on their own that they would rather do their own thing. So it evolved into something where the vendors actually own all of their plates, cups, and utensils, and we set up fairly robust um, uh, busing stations so that the vendors can get their stuff back. They're also required to use um, unique items, so they can't have the same plate as their neighbor or anyone else in the market. It's got to be a different color or different shape or something so that we know who to get it back to. Cool. Yeah, it's very cool. I love that idea, too, though, because my husband is always, like, wanting to eat, like, at food trucks or stuff. And I have this – I just hate standing up eating from a paper plate. Yeah. I feel like if I had a real plate, we could compromise. And I'll be like, okay, I'll stand up and eat if If I have a real plate. plate. A little more civilized. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So that seems um, amazing, but also like a, a, a pretty large infrastructure to have to set up and implement into your own farmer's market. So um, what do you think, you know, besides doing like a, a durable dining type thing um, would be what would be just like a really simple way to reduce some waste at farmer's markets that vendors or farmer's market managers could do? 
Yeah. Yeah. We, and getting to our, getting to the durable dining is something that, that went over years and we had vendor allies and, and there's a, there's a pretty, pretty big story behind it. So I certainly wouldn't recommend that farmers markets jump from, you know, styrofoam plates into durable dining. I don't think it would go over very well with anybody. Um, <laughs> so I think probably some of the easiest ways to reduce the waste are encouraging reusable shopping bags, reusable coffee cups. And then one thing that we do is we offer uh, water bottle refill stations in mm. our markets. So yeah, we just we get those like mm-hmm. big jugs of water. We label them with, you know, water bottle refill. When it's hot, we throw ice in them. Um, we encourage people if they are you know, using a cup or something that's throw away, at least they can reuse it one more time before they throw it into the trash. Um, and that's, that's, I mean, that's probably the simplest things to do. And, and the, the reason why it's the simplest is because markets can sell those things, you know, yeah. get a reusable tote with your brand on it and sell them. People want to buy those and then they'll be available and maybe a little less, a little less waste and more revenue for the market. Um, same with coffee cups and water bottles, even for that matter. Do you do the durable dining program at all of your farmers markets or just the Portland State one? Uh, Portland State for sure. And then our neighborhood markets, because what we found is that uh, PSU we focus on because of the volume there and we, we have to do something, mm-hmm. we feel. Mm-hmm. Um, our other downtown markets, because they're so heavily um there's so many tourists there and also there's a lot of people who work downtown come over for lunch take it back to their office we just don't feel like it's a good fit um it it would result in a lot of vendors losing their durable wares because they would wander out of the market Uh Um, so we we don't require it there if vendors want to do that we'll always support that and and offer busing stations for them Um, but no it's really the neighborhood markets where we see the same repeat shoppers every single week and then our, our portland state market where we see the most volume of waste Mm, gotcha. Cool. Do you have any suggestions of ways that um, vendors can help encourage their customers to be more um, eco-conscious? Mm-hmm. Uh, I know, you know, at our farmer's market in Little Italy, there are a lot of tourists. There's people from all over the place that may not be from areas where they're used to not just throwing away styrofoam with every meal. Mm-hmm. So are, do you have any suggestions that vendors could kind of help educate or implement in their own booths? Yeah, you know, and I think it's really difficult with tourists because you just you don't know your audience. It's like this mystery, right? You just yeah. sit there and you wait to see what happens. <laughs> um, but any time that vendors can offer an incentive to reduce the waste, I think it's a I think it's a good idea. So if you've got a coffee vendor, for example, who's willing to do fifty cents off your cup of coffee if you use your own reusable mug, and making that known. Or a, a farm vendor that if you bring your own reusable bag, maybe you get 10 cents off or something like that. Um, also, maybe not offering or over packaging things. So if you are a farm yeah. vendor and someone comes up with a, a, a produce bag full of green beans and wants to check out with green beans, there's probably no need to put that in an additional handled bag. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, agreed. I find that at our farmer's market, too. I'll have my re- reusable bag with me, and I'll buy, like, hummus or something. And I know that they see me with my reusable bag, and then he'll go to put it in a plastic bag. And it's, it's like, like, no, yeah, I can no. just put it in here. <laughs> <laughs> so just training vendors to look to see if the shopper yeah. has a reusable bag yeah. before they grab that plastic bag. I think that could make a huge difference. Yeah. 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 We, we do also allow our vendors to sell reusable shopping bags. So in the city mm-hmm. of Portland, um, handled plastic bags, what we call T-shirt bags, um, have been banned altogether. Mm-hmm. And that's at retail stores, farmers markets, everywhere. So we have we allow our vendors, we don't allow them to sell swag of any other kind, but they're allowed to sell a reusable branded um, tote for five bucks or less. Oh, um, that's and it. you can usually get those kind of lesser quality, but they still hold up just fine. Um, for about a dollar fifty a piece. And so there's a little bit of profit there. Your brand gets out into the world. Um, and you're, you're reducing plastic bags in the landfill. Yeah. And then that's available for shoppers who may not be close to maybe like your information booth that has bags for sale, but they need a bag right then. Yeah. So that's a good idea. We can't do it in our farm booths, unfortunately, because Mm -hmm. our ag department in California doesn't allow, that's considered a value product, value added product, not of your own production. Mm -hmm. And so it's illegal for them to sell t-shirts or bags in a certified farm booth. Mm Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. yeah. We're, right. We're working awesome. on it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do not like the sound of that. 
<laughs> so <Let> frustrating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's so strict. Hardcore. It's so crazy. I mean, yeah. it's yeah. only one of the things that this really restrictive on, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I was going to say the, the last thing for, for vendors to, to kind of encourage customers to be less wasteful is to maybe talk about the ways that they reduce waste on their farm or in their production kitchen or whatever it may be. Um, if the vendor is really committed to waste reduction, vendors, I don't know about at your market, but vendors at our markets, they're like rock stars. You know, they are the experts in farming or the experts in food production or recipe development or whatever it may be. If, if they believe in something and share it with the shoppers, that's their, that's their captive audience. And they may get people who are like, Oh, you've chosen not to use plastic in farming. I can choose not to use a plastic bag for my three apples. Yeah, Yeah, that's great. It's contagious. Yeah, Yeah, that attitude. Yeah, for sure. Um, In your bio, Amber, it says that you're proud of the way that the PFM has created inclusive spaces for the community. Yeah, Um, and it's our our um, our whole objective with farmers markets is one to to support food producers and growers, but also to create these vibrant community gathering spaces. And we spend a lot of time talking about what that means and what are vibrant community gathering spaces and by whose definition. Um, so one of, one of the things that we've done for, for years since about 2011 is matching uh, SNAP benefits at our markets. And that, that we do at all of our neighborhood markets at this point. Um, and we'll continue to do so. Lots of markets in, the, in Oregon do that and I think across the nation for sure. Yeah, we do that so that's one. Yeah, mm-hmm. so that's one way that's that's. I don't think we give ourselves enough credit for the impact that we make when we make that a priority for shoppers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Yeah. Um, And then other things that we've really kind of looked at, how do we, how do we increase the diversity of both our vendors and our shoppers at the market? Um, So more recently, the organization has really been going a little deeper into our diversity, equity, and inclusion objective through our strategic plan. Um, And, currently working on an equity lens, which I think I'm really excited about. You know, I don't even know how it's really going to be used in all of the, all of the aspects of the things that we do, but to have something where when you're going to make a decision, you can stop and pause and ask yourself, is this serving our equity, um, objectives or goals? And is it inclusive? Mm -hmm. We also offer, uh, translation services for vendors and shoppers, Oh. Um, we don't we don't advertise it as well as we could, but we're getting there. Um, where if a, a shopper comes and is non English speaking, we do have on demand translation services that we can use. Um, so call up on the phone and get any language in, in the world um, right right then. Um, and we're also doing that for uh, our vendor recruitment. So we'll go and talk to um, different organizations that support underserved. Uh, underserved business owners and farmers and and really kind of make it known what we're looking for, make it known what the process is for getting into our markets um, and really just kind of doing the work to um, talk about what we're doing and why it is for everybody and why, you know, some of our requirements seem like big hurdles for folks, but if we can offer um, support and patience and get everybody there, then there, then it's, it's worth the effort. And that one, the big, the big sticking point that we have is that we require any non-farmer to be sourcing 25% of their ingredients directly from farms. Hmm. And mm. if English is not your first language, that can seem like impossible. There's no way you can do that. You don't know who these farmers are. Why would you do that when you can go to a distributor and get the same quality of food that maybe came from that farm, a couple hands removed. But um, so, so really like targeted outreach to underserved populations for both our vendors and our shoppers, I would say is the, is the biggest thing that we're doing right now. And really identifying the communities that the markets are serving. Do you find then that, do you end up with farmers or vendors in the market then that have challenges with English? And if so, how do your shoppers react to that? Um, we do. Absolutely. Uh, this year we invited, I think, uh, six or seven brand new vendors to our Portland state market. And five of them are non English, non native English speakers. Um, and the English is, is pretty good. I think good enough to get by, um, and certainly good enough to serve food. Um, shoppers are really excited though. They're excited for something different. They're excited that there is, um, 
maybe a, a cultural option at the market, you know, a Chinese street bun kind of thing that you would find in China that's made by a woman that has been in the United States for five years and came from there and like can share that. You don't really need words when you've got food. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. That's true. <laughs> that so, it's like a grunt and point. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Hungry. We're all so visual anyway. We just point to the thing that looks delicious and I'll, I'll eat that. Thing <laughs> That's <anyway>. right. Yes. <laughs> That's great. That? Okay. So Amber, for our wrap up question, we always do a question of the week. <laughs> and this week's question is, what is your favorite or simple way of recycling every day or just like a creative little thing that you you reuse um, just in your everyday life? It's kind of a super general recycling question. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have one that's personal and then I also have one that's market related. But my personal <laughs> one is I love reusing um, cool things like maps or even like paper shopping bags as wrapping paper. Uh, um, <laughs> that like brown paper bag from a grocery store makes a really classy wrapping paper that goes with all colors of ribbon. <laughs> um, and then just weird things that you find or like, you know, you go to a national park and you get a map and using those kinds of things to wrap gifts as well. It's just kind of a unique, fun thing to do. Um, and then for my market one, I would say my most favorite recycling is using traffic cones as, um, uh, what are they, blow horns? What do you call them? Yeah. <laughs> the, like a mega, mega mega phone, like a megaphone. Like a megaphone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. So traffic cones, traffic cones, megaphones. I'm going to try that at the market. <laughs> I have not done that. I'm doing that tomorrow. I'm going to take a video of Kat doing that at the market. <laughs> tell you what. When you need to get a message to your vendors and there's only one way to do it, like, it can totally work. Right? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that's, so awesome. that's awesome. My, my mom has always used uh, comics from the newspaper to wrap presents just my whole <laughs> yeah. life. And my kids are so into it. One of my middle child, he's nine, he's obsessed with comic books in general right now. And now when she wraps <laughs> gifts for him, he the last time he got a gift, it was like a cool other kind of book that she wrapped up. And he's like... I don't even care what's in here. The best part about this gift is this <laughs> is this wrapping paper, this comic right here. Yeah. It took him forever to open it because yeah. he wanted to make sure to read each piece of We're the all comic. Waiting for him to open. We're like, open it up. He's yeah. like, wait, I'm not done. <laughs> so it's That's entertaining. Excellent. Recycling That's right. and entertaining yeah. together. That's right. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Yes, for sure. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you stole Kat's answer. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Actually, so, yeah, I've been doing so that for years. Ways. I don't even think of that as recycling anymore. Mm-hmm. I've been doing it for so long. My husband used to work uh, in construction when we had actual blueprints, and blueprints aren't blue anymore. I don't know if you know that, if you're not in that business, but when they were really blue, they were so beautiful. We used mm-hmm. to use those as wrapping paper, too. Those were fun. But yeah. now it's now it's comics all the way. But we actually find ourselves... My husband's older sister is much older than her, and so she was just on the tail end of the whole depression mentality and things, uh-huh. and um, much older than him, not much older than her. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so because she was pretty much a cheapskate, she was always appalled by mm-hmm. plastic utensils, and she would wash out her Ziploc bags. You know, if anybody brought something mm-hmm. in a Ziploc bag, she'd be washing them and reusing mm-hmm. them because she was just couldn't stand the, the cost idea of it. Yeah. And so we used to laugh at her, <laughs> and now I find myself a little stack of Ziploc bags uh-huh. next to my sink <laughs> that I've washed out, not so much because of the cost, which I obviously shouldn't be paying attention to, but because I just can't stand the idea of that plastic being used yeah. once and then going away so yeah. um, he's always coming by and saying ha huh, you've turned into Lindell <laughs> <laughs> Lindell would be proud <laughs> Lindell would be proud that's right it's your homage to her yeah, yeah. You do yeah I do that too um, <laughs> but my my like simp- my little thing that I do is I love to drink wine out of our hot sauce jars oh yeah they, they, do. Jars. Yeah, those <laughs> make, they do make good glasses they're like a little eight ounce yeah, jar yeah it's a nice I, weight yeah, yeah. It's, I feel kind of like an old Italian man who yeah. like, kind of like drink out of those like straight sided glasses yeah. Yeah. yeah that does make a good glass so that's like my it. thing for sure maybe you should sell those on the side baby Clyde still glasses <laughs> yeah so, well sets. Dave always says to people that you know how like uh, Welch's jam used to yeah, come in those like those kind glasses. of like Flintstones yeah. or those like cartoon jars yeah so it's kind of like our own little right take on that your Clydesdale, oh, Clydesdale yeah. Clydesdale glasses <laughs> yeah and you got a full set <laughs> yeah yeah collect them all yeah how about you Bridge? Well, 
I've been trying very hard to do lots of things. I always bring my own cup everywhere now, which I feel... You do. You're good about that. I'm really... I like to buy beverages all the time. Like, I'm always buying coffee or, like, Italian sodas or something. I like to have, like, a cold drink with me. And I just realized how many cups you accumulate. Like, not just cups, but, like, cup lid straw yeah. every yeah. time you do that when you're out. And so just buying, like, five reusable plastic cups with screw on tops and a straw really has saved so much and I feel like I'm really good about that and now I'm trying to keep straws reusable straws in my purse now too just to anytime I'm at a restaurant and a lot of restaurants around here are getting rid of plastic straws Mm -hmm. which is awesome but I like to drink out of a straw so I like to bring my own you know aluminum straw or whatever but I feel very clever lately because what I've done is uh, enlist my kids in the recycling and they are taking, like, cans and bottles to the recycling center, and you get, like, five cents a piece or something, which I have never been really excited about doing, but they are really into it. And so my (laughs) son is, like, digging plastic bottles out of everyone's trash can. (laughs) I told him he can't, like, go on the street and do it, but, like, he'll ask people for plastic bottles, and he does. He picks them up out of the trash at school and stuff, and so I feel like he's just saving the earth, and then we take it down to get recycled, and so I feel like getting the kids to work that's mm-hmm. the generation that's going to save us anyway. Yeah. So. That's true. Well, put entrepreneur. Him to yes. Yeah. And, <laughs> and then he gets Entrepreneurial to and, and recycling. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good combo. Yeah. And no work for me, really. It's going to, you know, we should ride our bikes to the recycling instead of driving. <laughs> <laughs> that's the next step. Driving in your huge SUV. Yeah, my huge SUV. To the recycling center. Yeah, maybe that cancels it out. Okay, let's think this It's a start. It's a start. You know the bus goes right by the recycling center of Vaughn, so keep that in mind. Yeah, and I have an idea. <laughs> awesome. Amber, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us, and yeah. we can't wait to see you again in February. Looking forward to it. Thanks for having me, you guys. Awesome. Yeah, Thanks thank so you. much. Okay, have Bye, a Amber. good one. Thanks. See you at the conference. Bye. See you. Bye. 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 Hey, thanks for listening along. Please leave us a review on iTunes and tell us how you liked today's episode. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss the next one. And if you want more Farmer's Market tips, you can subscribe to our weekly newsletter at IntenseBusiness.com and follow us on Instagram at IntenseBusiness. That's I-N-T-E-N-T-S, business. Amber will be joining us at the Intense Conference in February to talk about how farmers market managers can implement waste reduction systems even in places that aren't quite as eco-conscious as Portland. The 2019 Intense Conference will be held in San Diego, February 24th through the 26th. Amber will be there, will you? This podcast is produced by Intense Business, where passion meets profit. Today's episode was recorded and edited by Justine Marzoni Mead. Original music by David Mead. Special thanks to our guest, Amber Holland and San Diego Markets.